Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today on the third day of Vlogmas I am back, I almost forgot which is why I'm in my scrubs, more on that shortly, with my November reading wrap up. So all the books that I read in November which was a hodgepodge month in terms of actually doing reading but I'm shocked at how much I did read. So um, yeah but going to wear my scrubs, I promise these haven't been like mothballed or chewed on by mice, it did used to be fashion to have holes in clothes at one point um, and I've kept this baggy jumper ever since because it's perfect for wearing when you're doing things like the great shelf sort out, can you see all the books behind me and everything, of 2021, I'm getting my shelves ready for 2022 and then some of like, <gasps> the light's gonna go, I haven't made this video, so let's get cracking and let's get cracking with books. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of November, I did not do very much reading. I was uh, staying in an Airbnb with my boss on my new job um, in Scotland and um, we ended up talking about work probably way more than we should have and is healthy and I didn't get any reading time in for like a week. I mean, imagine, I'm surprised I wasn't crappy McCrappy soon. But once I did, it was the last ever RIP um, book hibernation, which is something I've been doing for the last couple of years, where over a weekend, a week, or in the end of fortnight it was, um, originally with, I think I did it on my own, and then I did it with Tom from Tom Reese Things, who's fine, by the way, just not making content. I have been in touch with him uh, quite recently. Um, and then my mum took over, um, where we would get prompts every season and read to those prompts. And um, yeah, I decided to uh, finish it this time though, because I found it quite stressful um, this time. And also because sometimes a change is as good as a rest, isn't it? So going through the prompts though, I did head to the first six books in just over a week. We had a fortnight, but like I said, for the first week, I didn't read anything. And um, the first of which was for the cozy prompt. And that was Richard Osman's The Thursday Murder Club, which was perfect as a cozy read. This is set in a retirement village where a group of people living there, who some of them would call themselves friends, some of them wouldn't, um, they uh, try and solve cold cases. Um, and it's kind of uh, led by Elizabeth, who's this fantastic character who clearly had like a life in MI5 or something before she retired to where she is. Um, and it's how Joyce uh, joins Elizabeth and Ibrahim and Ron. Uh, trying to solve cold cases until a real murder happens and then it's how they try and sort of solve the case themselves sometimes working with the police sometimes outwitting them sometimes letting them know things later on and we just follow on from that and what i loved is there's thrills and spills galore um there's murders that you don't expect or people die who you don't expect to which i thought was brilliant that said it does kind of lead me to its only flaw i don't do stars but i would have probably knocked half a star off for the fact that i don't think it would be possible at the beginning to guess who the murderer was or within the first like 50 pages to guess who the murderer was. And I do think that's something that I like within thrillers because even though I don't always get them right and I, you know, a red herring can send me right off, but um, I don't feel like even <laughs> if I'm honest, Sherlock Holmes could have solved this one really well, he probably could. But um, yeah, that was kind of one issue I had. And then the other one was that I just didn't like the kind of sugar shame in this book and how it sort of shamed fat people, it shamed people who like sugar, it shamed diabetics. That's just because as a diabetic, um, I find that kind of triggering because yeah, it, that felt, that was the only bit where I was like, Ugh. but other than that, I really, really, really enjoyed it. And it did remind me that sometimes books should just be fun and you should just get lost in them with great characters. And I have bought the second since reading this because I just thought it was so good. I will say, <laughs> um, Richard Oseman won a prize for this at the Books of My Bag Readers Awards and he wasn't there. So I took the prize and took a selfie with it uh, saying that I'd won Reader's Choice Award and people believed me. So um, that was interesting, Richard. Uh, sorry. Uh, so anyway, then a prompt was to read a book with Fall in the title. I picked up in London actually, Chris Riddell's Poems to Fall in Love With. And when I went to Waterstones to buy this, as I was leaving, I bumped into Alif Shafak. It was lovely. But this is um, an anthology by Chris Riddell, which he also illustrates. So there are fabulous illustrations galore in here. Let me find you another one. Um, and what I loved about this was that it was a real, well, it's maybe not the most diverse in terms of men and women, but also in terms of authors of colour. I did find it a really diverse selection in terms of you have Shakespeare and you have Auden, but you, and you have Emily Dickinson, but you also have like 
the guy, Edward Lear, like the guy who did um, the Bongi Boo and the Owl and the Pussycat. So there is a real mixture here. And I also like the fact that it, it is in parts. So like here we've got Valentine's, so that's all about like love, love. Um, but you'll also have like the love that people have for their family, or you'll have when you go through heartbreak or grief. And I thought it was a really, really brilliant anthology. I even enjoyed, and I'm not renowned for enjoying Shakespeare at all, but I really enjoyed his sonnet in here and the fact that it would then be next to the owl and the pussycat or something by Neil Gaiman or yeah I just really really enjoyed that element to it so I would re very much recommend this and I have another of his anthologies that I'm really really looking forward to. Then a prompt was for a book with a forest on the cover or trees on the cover or a remote forest so I picked up a book that I've been intrigued for ages, The Faster I Walk, The Smaller I Am by Kirsty A. Sconsvold, which the lovely Jen Campbell raved about a few years ago, quite a few times on her channel. I think she does bring it up every so often again. Um, and I've been meaning, to, and I picked it up from then. I think it's out of print because mine's like uh, withdrawn from stock. I only said withheld from the library, that's wrong. Um, but it's a really quirky, short tale that looks at a woman, well, it looks at kind of loneliness, it looks at love, it looks at loss, it looks at grief, it looks at like death, I guess. It's not making it sound particularly um, happy, but it's very darkly funny in a lot of ways. Like basically it starts off with this woman who, she goes through the obituaries um, to basically laugh at the fact that she's lived longer than some of these people. And then we start to get into her routine, what's going on in her life. And we start to sort of see, uh, moments of sort of dark glimmers behind this sort of brave facade that she has put on and um, yeah I thought it was a really really it, on the back it puts it perfectly actually somebody says it's a gloomy feel-good novel um, and I think that's very very true it is a gloomy feel-good novel and if you can get your mitts on it I would recommend it I don't want to give too much away because like I said it's very short which is possibly why I picked it because I was feeling under pressure and um, then a book that was the group read but also uh, ticked off the prompt of a book with a, predomin a predominantly orange cover was The Wolf Den by Elodie Harper and me and mum actually ended up interviewing Elodie I'll link that video down below and um, and I didn't know it was going to be the final book hibernation at the time but I'm really glad that it, this was the group choice for it because since mum's joined to co-host it with me, she's a classicist, this is set in the brothel in Pompeii, so it had that kind of the right timeline. I know mum really, really loved it. You can see her talking about it on her channel, um, Louise Savage Muses. Um, and um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, it's about a group of women who, as I mentioned, are the um, prostitutes working in a brothel, or the she-wolves as they're called, which is why it's called the wolf den. Um, and what I think Elodie Harper does brilliantly is these women are all enslaved in this and it's how some of them sort of resign themselves to that fact, it's how some of them fight against it, including our main character who I wanted to say the right name, Amara, thank you, I was going to say something else as I did on the live which was awkward. Um, but um, it's also how some women don't and, and it's how they work together, it's where the um where they sometimes work against each other it's how they can be pushed uh, morally in all sorts of different ways and i just thought what elodie harper did without sort of it being her intentions i found out is is write a book about contemporary blah, 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 write a book about how it was for women in classical civilization possibly at that time but also how that looks and reflects on or mirrors in some ways what is happening to women in contemporary times but also the sex trade now and the sex industry and yeah it has a real propulsion to it and it's a real page turner and I then found out I thought this was her debut but she's written two crime novels before which I wanted to head to and that really really made sense to me and um, but I thought the characters are brilliant and what I thought was great and this will link to it but I'm going to talk about later is that this wears its research really lightly on its sleeve but yet you know it's been really researched and that Elodie's had to throw quite a lot of that away in order for you to just read it and enjoy it and be lost in Pompeii. I will also say, me and my mum have a funny story about Pompeii. Um, we went there a few years after she um, was widowed. That's not the funny part of the story. Um, and uh, I would have been like 11, 12, I think. And because mum's a classicist, she spent hours there. And I was so bored and I was getting really grumpy and annoyed. And she took me to see this giant painting of the man with the biggest erection that I've ever seen 
in my life. I nearly added, and I've seen a few, well, I have added that now. Um, and, um, it made me absolutely burst out laughing. Um, and uh, yeah, that just, ha that, that haunts me. No, it doesn't haunt me. That has stayed with me since and always makes me chuckle a little bit. But this has really made me want to go back to Pompeii, not just to see the man with the big willy. But um, yeah, I um, I thought this was really, really good. It also kind of made me want to watch um, Pompeii with Frankie Howard. So uh, yeah, I just thought it was fab and I, I'm really excited to read the next in what is going to be um, the second of a trilogy. Uh, so yeah, really, really looking forward to that. Great book. Really, really good historical fiction. Um, then, uh, linking with this actually, there was um, a uh, prompt for a myth retelling. Now obviously this isn't a myth, it's based on fact. And also what I will say I loved is Vesuvius isn't really mentioned in this book because they wouldn't be thinking about it, would they? No, they wouldn't. Um, so uh, there's no foreshadowing either, which I thought was great. Um, anyway, sorry, on to my next choice, which was a myth retelling. And I picked Jesse Burton's Medusa, The Girl Behind the Myth, which is illustrated by Olivia Lemenech Gill. And I thought this was wonderful. It is a retelling, a reimagining with a very brilliant um, feminine lens. Feminine lens? Feminist lens. Blue and X, Simon. Um, yeah, retelling of Medusa. And the story is gorgeous. The images are just phenomenal. And I don't want to give too much of this away or share too many pictures because, like, this is a book that I want you to go out and buy and put into... Um, lots and lots of people of all ages stockings along with another book that I'm going to talk about but I just think Jesse Burton is so phenomenal and um, I think this is just is yeah it's just a wonderful wonderful book and I'm so excited because I know Natalie Haynes is writing a novel about Medusa and to have these sort of classical myth retelling is done with this feminist lens that do give a spin on women who are deemed gorgons or witches or anything like that from um, a society that was so led by men as you will read in this when you get to it because you will all read that and you will all read this um but um yeah i just love the fact that the, these contemporary retellings are happening and they're they are what's not but also with a different a different lens like i said so yeah this is absolutely brilliant as was um, the, there were two extra prompts and I only managed one of them which was to read a non-fiction book and it was Dear Sentharan, a black spirit memoir by Ikweke Ameze. Now, this book is utterly phenomenal and I, I can officially say now that Ikweke Ameze is one of my absolute favourite writers. Their book Pet, I absolutely loved. I have to say Freshwater, some of the writing I thought was incredible but some of it I was a bit unsure about. Um, but Pet was utterly phenomenal. The Death of Vicodo, just amazing. And this is quite incredible. Um, I should say it should come with some warnings around subject matters like suicide and uh, body dysmorphia. Um, and this is um, a memoir told through letters to different people um, in Aquake's life and uh, people who have been there for them in good and bad times. Um, and what I think is incredible about this book is it, it looks at gender or lack of gender in a really fascinating way. So, um, Kwaki Ameze was born named a woman um, or girl. And then when Freshwater came out, they were describing themselves as non-binary. And then they have realised and they've struggled with this all their life, that they are none of those things. They are a black spirit, which makes them... A real outsider and I think what I love about this book is it reminded me that we don't look at otherness the way we look in at otherness is wrong in the fact that we sort of how can I put it this celebrates being other but also shows how really difficult it can be and I think we're at a time in society where we're telling everyone to celebrate being different celebrate being different but don't be too different um, and this book looks at that because it looks at how certain ways of defining yourself are deemed acceptable um, or possibly not at the moment with with all the, the conversation around transgender issues but um, yeah I, I think it's just an incredible insight into not only that we are all spirits in many ways and that's what makes us who we are, our spirit, but how if you are other and you feel so othered by others, it can lead to body dysmorphia, which a Quaker writes about in detail and how they have gotten around that with various different surgeries and things, and how suicidal they became, 
um, and it's just a very raw, honest, open, incredible, thought-provoking book. Um, can't recommend it enough if you hadn't guessed from that. I've gone all serious now. So let's turn that right around with the book that I had read uh, back in September, I think, and then listened to but reread on audio. And it's great on audio. I loved it anyway as a physical book, but it's great on audio because there's ad libs, there's bloopers, etc. etc. It is, did I say that out loud? But Let's say that again, Simon. Did I say that outright is probably what I should because I didn't say it wrong. Did I say that out loud by Fee Glover and Jane Garvey, Notes on the Chuff of Life? And as I said before, and I've talked about it, I think I've talked about it on this channel, um, I um, love this because they, Fee and Jane take it in turns to write an essay on something that they just want to get off their chest or something that's bothered them particularly or has bothered them for a while. Um, and then the other replies, so it's almost like a right to reply. Um, and kind of this conversation comes in. It's the closest thing you can have to a podcast. And, and if you're not listening to, fortunately, their podcast, you really, really should be because it's brilliant. Um, but it's the closest thing I think you can come to as a podcast in book form. And it's just brilliant. But on audio, of course, you can ad lib and all that kind of stuff. So you get all of these extras and a little bit more of an insight into why they wrote about what they wanted to write about. And I just think it's brilliant. I should say I'm on tour with them at the moment. We've got one date left um, in Boris and Evans on December the 19th. So if you'd like to come, I'll try and remember to link that down below, um, the date. But um, yeah, it's just really funny. But also, I will say... There are real layers and depths to this, like they look at divorce, they look at um, thoughts around death um, and how long you might want to live, as well as orgasm merchandises and candles that smell like your vagina. So what more could you want in a book, frankly, but on audio it is a real, real treat. So if you're looking for something that you can listen to and laugh a lot to, but also will make you think, great stocking filler too, as is. This, and I think I'm going to talk about this and a couple of these other books actually in a video which I'm going to make all about perfect books for, I think it's Foljokoflod? Foljolbokoflod? I need to get that right before I make the video, but basically it's the Icelandic flood of books where on Christmas Eve you give someone a book and then you spend the rest of the evening reading it. And, and this will definitely be one of those recommendations because I think Julia and the Shark is blinking fantastic. It's by Kilren... <laughs> What is wrong with my words? It's because I was wanting to actually say, just let me put this down a second. That book, this book has won Gift for Children's uh, Book of the Year for Waterstones. I think it should have won Waterstones Book of the Year or something else should other than the book that did win because I love Waterstones absolutely dearly. Really, really love it. They're very, very special to me. Uh, when I was a kid and we didn't have very much money, we would once a month go and I would be allowed to buy a new book from Waterstones. It was a real treat. So for me now to see them give a give book of the year to a book that costs seventy pounds, I think is pretty gross, and I am quite cross about it. But we all make mistakes. People that we love make mistakes, and so I need to get over it. But I just I'm, I don't know who made that decision, but I think they were wrong. Possibly should be given the P forty five. But anyway, going back to the person who made the decision to make this one of their other books of the year, correct, because Julia the Shark is amazing. Now, Kira Maud Hargrave is an author I adore. I've read quite a few of her books and loved every single one. This is with her husband, uh, the artist Tom DeFreston. And from the off, I mean, it's a thing of beauty, like the cover's gorgeous. The end papers are stunning. And then you have like moments in it, which are this tracing paper effect. It's just phenomenal and it's all about a young girl called Julia who moves away from her home down south to a very remote island in Scotland as her mum is looking into um, uh, a famous green shark who moves so slowly that they can live for hundreds of years and she wants to do research to see if how the shark lives could help people with Alzheimer's and as it goes on we realise actually that um, Julia's mum has some mental health issues herself. And just the way it's done through these pictures is just so wonderful. Um, and I think it's not a book that should be just read by younger people. It's a book that should be read by everyone because it deals with things that we all have to deal with at some point. It looks at friendship, it's one of my favorite pages. I just think the way the artwork works with the writing is just phenomenal. It's such a beautiful pairing. I mean, they're a married couple, so it should be, but you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, I, I think it's such an important book, but also such a joyful book to read. I just enjoyed it, even though it was dealing with some really hard themes. Um, and yeah, can't recommend this one enough. I also got a huge shock at the end because I'm in the acknowledgements, which I was not expecting. No one had told me that. But yeah, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that. I will be talking about that more 
the shit. That's all I'm going to say. Um, a book then that slightly disappointed me, if I'm honest, but I think that's partly my fault. Partly in the fact that I had possibly overhyped it in my head. I was so excited to read it. I thought it was going to be one of my favourite books of the year. Um, also partly because I think I had um, created a synopsis for it that wasn't right. I don't read blurbs, so that's also partly my own fault. The book is The Fortune Men by Nadifa Mohammed. And this is set after the Second World War when um, lots of um, black men um, and men of colour were brought to the UK to fill in in industry where due to so many people dying during the war there were a lack of well there was a lack of labor and so they became that labor but once things started to get back to normal they were then dispersed and displaced or fired or yeah um and we follow one particular man Mahmood who has been through that he got married in Wales his wife has left him with her child with their children um and uh, down the road we meet these two sisters um, who are running the um, grocery shop and one of them is brutally murdered and uh, Mahmood is instantly deemed like the prime suspect because the police just want to pin it on him. We know he didn't do it um, pretty much everyone knows he didn't do it except for the police and this trope I think because I've read that trope a couple of times in the last couple of years um, and that's not this book's fault, but I think that lessened it for me slightly. But I think the thing that really didn't work for me... So I will say I really enjoyed it overall. I did enjoy, really enjoy it. I enjoyed it overall a lot. Um, but I think this book, kind of the polar opposite end of the spectrum from The Wolf Den, this really shows its research and I felt sometimes was almost dense in showing you the research or, or dense in its research in order to kind of highlight what it was trying to say. And I think it could have just done with a defter touch or a slight edit from that. I might be massively in um, the minority here. And actually I probably am because it's up for the Costas. Um, it's one of the shortlisted fiction books, but it just, I don't know. There was something about it that I found so dense that it kind of, it took the, and I don't know whether it is because it was trying to make make me feel claustrophobic in its density i mean also there's not much breaks in the text i'll be honest and that is just something that i don't like personally um but i i found it i don't mind heavy subject matter in fact that's something that i really quite enjoy and i like being challenged but when a book just feels heavy and dense it felt sort of like like i was surrounded by fog but the fog was all facts and history and i don't know it, it it, it was a shame for me, a shame that one. Um, but I did enjoy it overall, but it was like a three out of five for me. Um, maybe I need to read a different point, but I'd read it also, I should say, because it's set in Cardiff and that really excited me because not that many books are set in Cardiff, um, particularly around that time or this kind of storyline, even though, as I mentioned, the, the storyline of someone being falsely accused when we know they didn't do it isn't necessarily um, something that you don't see that often. But um, I was in Swansea and Newport, and Newport actually got a mention when I was on the train going back from it, which I really, really loved. But um, I thought that would add to it, and yeah, I don't know. I think I maybe just put too much pressure on that book, and that wasn't very fair of me. The next book I read, and this is the proof edition, how beautiful is this, is The Stranding by Kate Sawyer. And when, oh no, it was in my last vlog, wasn't it? Yeah, in my last vlog, I talked about why I picked this, and because I'd seen that this was on the Costas, and so I thought, oh, I will read one of the other books that's um, up for shortlisted for the costas um, and that is this it's up for the debut and i had heard the premise of this was that it was about a woman uh in kind of a dystopic post-apocalyptic world who was living in the uh, bones of a whale and so i was really really intrigued for by it and the first 200 pages of this i whizzed through um it's it's set sort of in the future or it's set in um, Ruth's future. I keep wanting to call her Kate every time because the author's called Kate, but it is Ruth. Let me just double check that because at the moment, me and names, Ruth, it is Ruth, I'm right. I shouldn't second guess myself so much. Anyway, um, so <laughs> Ruth is, um, at, the, at the start of the book, Ruth is in New Zealand. She sees a beach whale. She meets a strange man, uh, not strange man, a man who is a stranger to her. And as they're talking, there is this glow on the skyline and they both run for cover, which happens to be inside the beached whale's mouth and they survive something horrendous. Now, you do have to 
suspend your disbelief for a little while on that one but the way it's written is so gripping but also you alternate back to like a year before when we get to know more about Ruth and how she's having an affair with a married man which is keeping secret from everyone and she sort of is a little bit lost in life but how she ends up getting to New Zealand goes along with the pace of what happens post being inside the whale when something apocalyptic happens and I literally race through it. I will say the second half it started to do something. I sound like after I just talked about this, like a right curmudgeon, but I have raved about books and I do really, really, really like, like this. Like this is a 4.5 for me. Um, and these are the only reasons that it didn't get a five out of five because I could suspend my disbelief about being in a way, all that was fine because it was written so brilliantly. What I struggle with is when you have two timelines and you're alternating and they start to mirror each other. So certain subjects just happen to come up then in the past that are just coming up now. I just, it's, a, it's something that I don't like. I find it a little bit lazy, if I'm honest. Um, but, and that happened a couple of times with this, but that said, I forgave it that, and as I said, suspended my disbelief because the writing is corking and I cannot wait to see what Kate Sawyer writes next. So yeah, that's the finished copy, uh, cover. I have a finished copy coming, which I'm very excited for because yeah, I, I want to have that on my shelves. I think it's brilliant. Then a book that I quite enjoyed was Quite uh, by Claudia Winkleman, which is Love, Life and Eyeliner. And this is various essays on different things, a bit like with, um, did I say that out loud, that um, Claudia wants to talk on. They can be things like her fringe, uh, which she's famous for. She presents on Strictly Come Dancing here in the UK and BBC Radio 2. I adore her. She's one of my all time favourite presenters. Um, she talks about how boots are really important and can like uh, they can sort of build how you feel in a way or there's a, an essay dedicated to squirrel etiquette that her son wanted her to write and there's some beautiful things some beautiful pieces in here like there's one to uh, one piece dedicated to nurses that I just thought was utterly phenomenal however there are also some times where I felt like I don't know it was almost like there was she was really judging people a bit too harshly like and then this again might just be because it I felt like I was being judged by her, frankly. Um, there's one bit she, it's like, do it all in black. Don't wear anything other than black. Like, if you're wearing lots of bright colours, you're overcompensating, you're going to disappoint people. And, and I was like, I like wearing a bright colour. There's nothing, as she described it, you're dressing like a kid's TV presenter. I don't think there's anything wrong with dressing like a kid's TV presenter. And also, look at the colour of your paperback. Um, but yeah, overall, I listened to this on audio and I did really, really enjoy it. I came away with some things that really made me think and that sort of, running with my sort of no-nonsense attitude that I'm trying to really, really build on and that actually there were some points in here that I found really helpful with things that, or, or ways in which she lives or things that she does that you can take on board. But yeah, just sometimes I found it not preach exactly, but just a little bit like, not condescending either, just a bit judgy occasionally. And that wasn't what I was expecting from Claudia one time. So um, there we go with that one. And then last but not least, um, although I started another book after this in November, but um, I'm reading it now, so I'm not putting it in my wrap up, is The Retreat by Alison Moore, which is just brilliant. I love Alison Moore. She's an author that I think should be much, much, much wider read. She was up for the booker with her debut, The Lighthouse. I then read He Wants a Second Art, which I think is incredible. It's one of my favorite books of all time. Um, and I read Death and the Seaside earlier this year. I haven't read Missing or her short stories, but I have those to go, which is good. And this is all about a woman called Sandra who since childhood has been fascinated by an island. Islands have come up a few times actually, or the sea's come up a few times in my reading recently. Um, and she's always wanted to go. It was owned by like a former Hollywood star. And then when she's older, she sees an advert that she can go and stay there. It's a retreat now and she can go and experience it. And we also meet Carol, who's going over to somewhere else on the island. And it's how their stories intertwine. I don't want to give too much away, but what this has, which I love in every single one of Alison Moore's books, the way she builds atmosphere and tension and slight unease and dread is phenomenal. And the way that she looks at how bloody weird we are as humans and how our behaviour can be so absurd is also really brilliant. So yeah, I cannot recommend this enough. Um, and you may see me talk about that one more this year too. So there we go. I'm really sorry that was like 30 minutes. I wasn't expecting it to be that long because it's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve books. But hey ho, that's what happened. Um, my throat has gone dry. Give me one second. 
I would love to know if you've read any of these, what you thought of them. Did you like them? Did you not? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. I'd also like to know what you read and loved or didn't loved or anything in between in the comments down below. Tell me everything and all. And um, yeah, reading wrap ups are back. This is actually the second time I've recorded this because I got halfway through it and was so miffed with what I was saying and annoyed with myself and forgetting character names and getting my words mixed up and everything, which apparently is part of my condition, Durkham's um, confusion. So that's something that is coming more to the fore at the moment, which is quite unsettling, but let's all move on from that because this is a jolly video. I need to get back to sorting these books out. So I'm going to go. I will see you tomorrow when I will be talking to you about some savage stationery, which I cannot wait to share with you. I'll speak to you then. Bye.